Welcome to the Beyond the Lines podcast. In a world filled with so much hate and division, we want to do something about that. We all have lines that we draw in our lives where we feel like that is our limit. We can't listen past that line. We can't love past that line. We can't understand someone who is on the other side of the line. But our goal with this podcast is to treat all people with the dignity that they deserve, even if we disagree with them. My name is Jonathan Miller, and I'm your host today for the podcast. And also on the podcast, we have a couple amazing guests, Jamie and Donna Winship. We just had a podcast with you um, last time, but we're doing another one because there's so much more we can learn from you. I wish we could do a thousand. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm so honored to have you today on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank it's you. great to be here again. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you guys are just Incredible. You have decades of experience being peaceful solutions to some of the world's highest conflict areas. Um, You left the American dream behind, and we talked a lot about that in our last episode. And you took your three boys and spent 25 years in Indonesia, Iraq, Jordan, Jerusalem, these places that most people wouldn't consider to be a a peaceful place uh, to raise your family. And uh, we talked a lot about last week, or whatever, our last episode, that... That actually brought you more joy than you you ever could have had with the white picket fence of the American dream being safe in your in your yard. And we're going to talk about that today. And I'm really excited about that. But before we go any further, I want to make sure you guys check out what these guys have to offer. They have uh, their website, identityexchange.com, where you can have more resources and learn on your own journey, find your own identity and 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 to live into that. Do you guys have anything to say about that? (laughs) <laughs> we have like three hours to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, the understanding uh, our true identity was the deepest transformation we both experienced. For me and Jamie, it was, for me, I was 20 years of being a believer before I even, being a believer, before I even knew that was a concept. If mm. I can just say real quick, one of the... There's many, many verses on identity and many case studies in scripture of people coming into their true identity after a life-changing encounter with God. Think of Moses, think of Gideon, think of Paul, think of Peter. All of them, not Moses, but all the others had a name (laughs) change, mighty man of valor, rock, Saul to Paul. And Isaiah 43, 1 says, I have formed you, O Jacob. I have called you Israel. Name change. Do not fear. I have redeemed you and called you by name so you will know that you are mine. Awesome. And then it goes on to talk about how God is with you. When you go through the fire, I'll be with you. When you go through the flood. So we are going to encounter difficulties in this life. But if you understand who you are and that Jesus is with you in it. It's a game changer, really. And so at Identity Exchange, we help people learn to live fearlessly in their true identity by hearing from God and living that out, learning to trust that still small voice that they sense. And we have resources at Identity Exchange, courses. We have a new one coming out in the spring called Becoming What You Believe. And you can sign up there at the website for our email to be alerted of events and new things that we're doing. Awesome. So check it out at identityexchange.com. You, you don't want to miss it. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, in our last episode, we explored a small glimpse, I'm sure, just a small glimpse of your journey in the Middle East and moving over and learning what that meant. And um, today I want to just dive right into the wisdom that you've gained on peacemaking through all of those experiences. Um, we all deal with conflict every day in some way. So how do you learn to be a peacemaker, especially with people uh, we might call our enemies? Yeah, that's uh, that that I think to me, that's the one of the greatest things about the gospel. If you if you think about it, that amazing verse in Romans 5 and even in Colossians 1 where it says that Christ died for us while we were his enemies. Hmm. Th- that's what the whole message is about, is that we're hostile. We have this hostility towards God and the things of God, and and God is demonstrating to us his love. We only love God because he first loved us. Hmm. And then how do we know he loved us? Because he demonstrated his love toward us in that we, while we were his enemies, while we were sinners, while we were separate, he died for us. Wow. The, I don't know of a, you can't look at the cross really and have an enemy. 
because you are the enemy. I was the enemy. And what did God do with me? He, he Philippians chapter 2, Jesus emptied himself to take on the form of a servant and to die the death of shame of a criminal. Why? For me, his enemy. For me, the one that denies and betrays him. So if you're going to embrace Christ, if you're going to truly embrace Christ and to imitate Christ, then you will be seated, living with your enemies very intentionally like Jesus did. Forgiving them because they know not what they do. That's right. Hmm. Wow, that is so powerful. But I think if we think of, if we think of just generalize, right, and we think of Christian history and church history, oftentimes we've failed royally at being peacemakers. Uh, Sometimes we're the source of conflict. That's right. And that's just general, obviously. There's um, Western culture in general, I think, who aren't Christians, sees Christians as hypocrites for this reason and, and hateful people. Why do you think this has happened? I mean, it's a simple, it's, you know, these, all of these issues, we make them really complicated. They're not complicated. So it's, it's a, it's an old saying for strategists, complexity models don't have to be complicated. Things can be complex, but they're not complicated. What makes things complicated is one word, fear. Mm. Fear is what, fear. Fear is our worst enemy. And that's why the number one exhortation throughout Scripture is do not be afraid. Over and over again, from Adam and Eve on, Adam and Eve, they they separate from God because they believe something about God, something about themselves, something about the world that they're in that's not true, and it leads them to wrong action. And that's one thing. The, uh, but the, the lie that really hurt them is once, that, once they failed was that they should be afraid of God now. Mm. To, to, for any human to think that they should be afraid of God, and I'm, I'm going to say that many, many Christians are afraid of God, mm. then you have to self-protect against God. And that's what Adam and Eve do. They hide they cover themselves, they begin to self-protect in their relationship with God. Now, if you're going to self-protect in a relationship with love itself, you're going to be in conflict the rest of your life in everything that you do. So the message of God, once again, is do not be afraid. And what casts out fear is not courage, not weapons, not a secure, strong defense. What casts out fear is perfect love. Again, so now we're, we're back in a circle. Well, what's perfect love? Love demonstrates itself to us in that while it is, while we are the enemy of love, love sacrifices on our behalf. So the root cause of conflict is fear. That's mm. what it is. It's fear. I'm afraid of you. Um, and I'll say one more thing about that. Uh, humans, research shows, are only born with two fears. Humans only have two and eight fears. You can see this in infants, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Those are survival fears. They're embedded in the reptilian brain. Those two fears. All other fear is learned. We learn to be afraid of other people. We learn to be afraid of dying. We learn to be afraid of not being good enough. All these fears are taught to us by the world around us, wow. by our parents, even, even unintentionally. And so we grow up believing these fears are real and true. And once you're, once you're fearful, the only thing you can do is self-promote and self-protect. As soon as you do that, you are in conflict with those around you who are also self-promoting and self-protecting. And that's how the false, what we call the false self develops, the shadow self, the false self, the ego self. It's not necessarily bad. It's the coping mechanisms that you develop in this self-protecting and self-promoting. But Jamie, I wanted you to give your, you're talking about love, and I wanted you to just give, you know, we think of love and we think of a warm, fuzzy feeling, Hollywood romance, hmm. but what's a, re- give a, your definition, not yours, but our research definition of 
true love what it is true love yeah and this is this is i think philippians chapter 2 again true love is is other focused self emptying and unconditional that's what love is it's other focused it's self emptying it's not self denial you're not denying the true self you're emptying yourself you're sacrificing on behalf of the other um, and it's unconditional. It's not conditioned on they're on my team. They believe what I believe. That's it. That's the standard that we're called to. So whether you, when you love your spouse or your kids, it's in a good relationship. It's other focused, self emptying, and it's unconditional. Imagine foreign policy built on that definition. Mm. It. it, it it absolutely ends conflict. You cannot have conflict with other focus, self-emptying, unconditional love. You cannot, it cannot be done. As Jesus demonstrates over and over again. Hmm. But like you said, why that doesn't happen often is fear. Right. We're afraid like, well, they're not going to, they're not going to love me. Like I, right. if I do that. If I do that, they're not going to do the mm-hmm. same for me, and I'm going to be gone. Right. Or they're going to take advantage of me. Yeah. Or I'm going to be weak. Right. So there. So then we need a process for that. Again, so we go back to the scriptures, which, um, which are showing from the beginning of humanity, as we understand it, through all the ages, male, female, uh, different cultures, is giving us case studies of what does this look like and how does it work. And so sort of the three, we call them sacraments, and I wish they were more, I wish they were practiced more among believers, but we have this really interesting sort of circle, and and the three words are this, confession, repentance, transformation. So this is, this is the everyday process of how do we end conflict, and so if, I, so if I can take those words, confession, repentance, and transformation, those, are, those unfortunately have become church words and Christian words. And, they, and in our mind, confession just means to say you're sorry a bunch of times. Mm. And, we, and repentance means the same thing to us too. Repent, sorry. Confess, <laughs> I'm sorry. Repent, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> confession, sort of sorry. Repent, really sorry. And transformation, you're not even going to get to that. So, but what confession means is to tell the truth. That's what it means. Confession doesn't isn't have to be positive or negative. I confess I'm a citizen of the United States of America. That's a confession. Um, I confess that I don't like minority people. That's also a confession of truth. Mm. Tr- truth telling, Jesus said it, you shall know and experience truth, and that is what will set you free. Truth, truth telling. So repentance then, if you tell the truth in a scenario the real truth, the deep truth, then you have the opportunity to repent, which means to change the way you think and go in a new way, a different way. Like we're going to do this in a different way from now on, which is mind change, metanoia, mind change, truth tell, allows for mind change, metanoia. Once your mind has changed, then you can change the form of what you do, metamorphe, transformation. So, and, and we've done this, in so many different scenarios over so many years. But I'm just saying on an individual, personal level, if I do not know how or am unwilling to tell the truth about what I really am afraid of in my life, you will never experience repentance. So confession and repentance is like telling God, telling perfect love, your truth, I'm afraid of you, I don't believe you're going to provide for me, I'm a terrible parent, I'm worried my kids are going to be messed up, I'm a f- look at our world today, COVID, politics, telling God your truth, getting it out, it takes up space, you know, in your spirit, get it out, and then this is the prayer that literally changed my life, that if you were listening to the other podcast, I learned in that second place that we lived, But telling the truth and then saying, God, what do you want me to know? Replace it with his truth. You know, our truth is a perception, Mm. and perceptions are not always true, and the truth is not always your perception. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So I tell him my truth, he replaces it 
with what really is true, then I can be in this process that Jamie was explaining of changing the way I live based on that. And when you have an encounter with God like that, an exchange, this is why we call what we do identity exchange, when you have that great exchange, you are able to walk in a new way. It's not just self-will, self-power. It's a supernatural interchange with the living God that empowers you to actually walk then in the new way. This is what we're seeing with Gideon, my mighty man of valor. Go and save your people Israel. He's hiding in a cave against his enemy. And we know the rest of the story. If you don't, go to Judges mm. and, and read it. We see it continually in the Gospels with his interactions with Peter. And in the end, Peter becomes the rock on which he hands him the keys to the kingdom. Mm. And so this telling God your truth we don't want to admit it. We're afraid to tell God we don't believe in him. He already knows it, <laughs> right? So why get it out in the open and let him change the way you think, receiving his truth. And then it's risky. Walk in it. Intentionally practice what you sense. So this is that circle. Truth tell, mind change, form change. Truth tell, mind change, form change. Confession, repentance, Transformation. Transformation. So it's a daily moment by moment practice. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Stop conforming to the patterns of your own little world, all your coping mechanisms, being controlling, being perfect. All of these is what creates that false identity of self protection and self promotion. Stop conforming to those patterns, but be transformed. Then you will test and prove the good, perfect, pleasing will of God. I think if we all told the truth, we're afraid that God's will is not good and pleasing and oh, perfect. Yeah. We're afraid he, we're afraid he's going to make us sick. We're afraid he's going to make us poor. We're afraid he's going to send us to some godforsaken country. <laughs> yeah. And I think you guys uh, at our last episode uh, might have brought that fear up in some people. Like, oh, no, they're talking yeah. about how great it was to move to Indonesia. I don't want to move to Indonesia. Yeah. They're like, like squirming in their seats. Like, that's the only way I can find joy. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not doing it. You know, I think, uh, why, why are we so afraid of God? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's like I'm saying, all fear is learned. So when we're working with people and, and someone says, um, you know, if, if they'll tell the truth, it's like if you think about Abraham in Scripture, you, if you watch Abraham, Abraham goes from a person who believes in planets, he, he, he's, uh, he's an animist, and suddenly this God is talking to him, and he has to go through this journey of discovering who that is. Can I trust this God? And when he goes over into Egypt, remember he lies about Sarah and says it's his sister because he's afraid of the, the, the leader in Egypt. And his question really is, his question really about God is, can God cross geographic borders? Because in, in Abraham's mind and in the world he's in, gods are geographic, they're local. Mm. And they can't cross into another God's territory. And that sounds kind of funny, but that's exactly what American Christians believe, that God is really powerful in some states in the United States, not in all of the United States. And if we leave the United States, he's less powerful. Mm. And if we go into a Muslim country, he may not even be there. This is so false. This is the God that's omniscient and omnipotent, but that's not what we believe. But we're never challenged in that belief. We're never sitting down going and, and, and saying to God, you know, God, I really don't either. You're, you're either unable or unwilling to protect me and my kids if we don't live in this school district or we homeschool or like this. Can I just give an example of that? Yeah. From, so we were living in Baghdad um, in uh, Iraq 2003, 2004, and it was, you know, it's, it was the war was going on and, and um, people were dying every day and we didn't live in any military security zone. We lived in central Baghdad. Um, uh, you know, we were exposed to be killed, kidnapped pretty much any, whenever. 
so to live in that scenario, you know, you, it takes time. You have to learn to really trust the Lord. And, and he, God is so gracious on how he, he leads you forward. And just watch Jesus training the disciples. He's gracious with them. He keeps doing the lessons over again until they really start to grasp this truth. With me, you cannot die. That's what Jesus keeps telling. Do, do you not know that I have taken away the power of death from the one who holds it? And I've, Hebrews chapter two, I've delivered you from the burden of the fear of death. You cannot die. And then Paul says, wow, to live is the hard part. To die is the best part. But Christians don't believe that. Hmm. Our whole life is committed to protecting our own life. That is the whole goal of our relationship with God. Our whole life is self-promotion and self-protection. We learned it. We were taught that God doesn't protect. God only protects smart people. God only protects good schools stewards. He doesn't protect reckless, sacrificial people. Like This is what we're taught. Um, anyway, so in Baghdad, we're in Baghdad, and um, we're on, we have a team working there, and we work, uh, we, we're working as part of the coalition of the U.S. there and a State Department NGO. Um, but we live in this, this regular neighborhood, and, and in that scenario that we were in, People on our team were killed. Americans on our team were killed. Hmm. So as that's going on, because we're human, it does start to wear on you. And in Baghdad, our two of our sons were with us in Baghdad. Um, you know, and they were I they were teenagers and they're living in this war zone. They can't really go to school or anything. So it was a really challenging time. Well, what was happening to me was slowly I was becoming fearful. Even after the years we've been working in these places, just the every day, the bombings, you could hear the car bombs every day, the, the, the mortar fire, you know, over our house down into the green zone, which was in the distance from where we lived. It, it just starts to wear on you, and you have to practice the disciplines of ho- abiding in Christ. Mm. You don't just drift into them. You have to, it, it's a discipline. It's like doing push ups and just, and just stay with me, Lord. Help me to, how do I understand the scenario that just happened? That was our team that just got killed there. What do you want us to know? And what do you want us to prove to know and do about that? It's like, Oh, if you're a Christian, you're never going to get killed. Like that, there, that is nowhere in the Bible. In mm. fact, it's the opposite. <laughs> Um, and so working through all that, but I was slowly becoming fearful. It's like a cancer that just gnaws on you. And the enemy's always like, can God really protect you in this place? What kind of maniac brings their teenage kids to this place? And our kids at the time were getting in a car and driving to some hidden location where there was a kind of a high school going on and they'd have to drive across the city and we didn't, couldn't communicate with them because we didn't have, there was no phones. And so we would put them in the car and then they would just drive off with this Iraqi driver and we would just have to wait until they got to the school and say they made it. But in the time frame, the 45 minutes, an hour, whatever, there's the city's in a war and you're just like, God, don't let them get kidnapped. Don't let them get bombed. Don't get them in a crossfire to just for them to get to school. We made it. And then at three o'clock we're leaving. We're coming on the way home. God help them not to get every day, day after day. And it just starts to wear you down. Mm. Um, and so I was becoming more and more fearful. And what, what happens when you become fearful, then you start to self promote and self protect and, and it produces separation. Fear produces separation or sin. So I started to separate from the Iraqis that worked with us because it, deep in my mind, it's like, well, who's going to kill them? It'll be Iraqis. It'll be people like them, the, my own friends that worked with us. Wow. And I started to not talk to them as much. And then my team that's looking to me for leadership, my American team, they start imitating me. So my fear starts to infect my team like that. And so we start to separate from the Iraqis. But we also start to separate from each other, and we've clearly separated from God. Wow. <laughs> just slowly. And this is the sin we should be afraid of. We're not afraid of this. We, we'll, we'll tolerate this kind of separation from God all the time. It's called self-protection. That's fine. Just don't have any moral breakdown. But you can live a completely isolated, separate life from God. And so that was going on, and Donna was not experiencing it. Donna has this amazing capacity to to trust God and to so it wasn't affecting her. So one night I wake up and I'm very I, I know what's happening. I can and, and the, the spirit of God is like, you need to we need to deal with this because this is causing you to dislike 
Muslims hmm. who I've called you to love because you're afraid of them because you think they have power over your future. You think they, and so I go up on the roof of our house there and back First then. he wakes me up and makes me go in every room oh, yeah. of our house with him and pray <laughs> and go in the boys' room and lay hands on them and pray. It's like three in the morning. And finally, I'm like, do you feel better? I want to go back to bed. <laughs> she was at total rest. It's and really I went back to bed and missed everything that happened on the roof. <laughs> so Jamie went up to the roof. You know, Arab houses have flat roofs where people go to be cool and because it's so hot. So I was up on the roof and I, and I'm standing where we lived. You could, I could look to the right and there was a huge um, Sunni mosque and to the left was a huge Shia mosque. So the war, two warring factions of Muslims in Iraq a lot. And then the American base was f- straight ahead of us. And so this is all just one giant war zone and the Kurds mixed in. And so I'm standing up there, at, you know, I don't know, th- three in the morning or something like that. And I just, I truth tell to God. I confess. And I yell out. I said, God, this is what I believe about you. You are either unable or unwilling to protect my kids from being killed by terrorists. Like, I'm living in a place where I've, even you can't protect them. Not every day. Some, mo- a lot of time, but not every day. What are the odds? Like that. So I'm truth telling what I really believe about God and the world that I'm in. You can't do it. And because you're either unable or unwilling, I don't know which is worse, it's on me. And I know I can't do it, and I'm falling apart, and I'm starting to dislike and not love Muslims because of it. What do you say? <laughs> this Repentance is now then, listen to God, answer. God, he already knows I believe all that. Why am I living this life pretending like I'm faithful and I'm not? And so what do you say? And I just stand there and I look to my right and there uh, on the roof of our house is a a soldier standing on the, in the corner of the roof, right? A a distant from me, you know, 20 feet is this soldier. And he's a, it's a U.S. He's wearing a U.S. uniform. It's a big guy looking that way, looking, you know, that towards the Sunni mosque. And I'm like, wow, that is weird. Why is a U.S. soldier on our roof? And then I look to my left and there's another one in this corner of the house looking towards the Shia mosque. And then there's two behind me. And I'm just looking at these soldiers. And I I can't see their face because their backs are to me. They're just like standing sentry. And then it just dawns on me all of a sudden, there are no U.S. soldiers here. They're not even working. They They would never be anywhere near where we are. This is God answering me whether I'm protected or not. They're his soldiers. And I just knew it. And I didn't know what, I was speechless. And it was like God was saying to me, don't tell me whether I'm able to protect you or not. Don't, don't tell me how things really are. Ask me how they really are and go by what I say. And you are protected and you are safe. Go to bed. And so <laughs> that was it. And I just, I just said, I looked at this soldier and I just said, thank you for serving the most high God. I mean, I don't know what you say to what seems to be like angelic. And I just go down and I get in bed and I'm just like, that was it. The fear was gone. What, what casts out the fear? God's love for us, truth, his truth takes away fear. Not security, not money, not, you know, for, that's not, that's what the world says takes away fear. It doesn't. It's a lie. It's what Satan said to Jesus. I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth. I'll give you a secure bank account. Bow down and worship me. And Christians do it for the sake of that kind of security. But so I go to bed, get up the next morning. I say our, our 17 year old son is in the kitchen and I say to him, are you afraid here? They're the only American teenagers in the entire country. Wow. <laughs> and I said, and they're going to school. They're the ones in the car, not me. And I said, are you afraid here? And he says to me, are you? It's a great question for parents to think about where. And I said, no, I'm not. Thankfully, the next day I wasn't. He said, then why would I be afraid? What he was saying to me was, I will learn my fear from you. And parents teach their kids that God is not enough. Money's more, military's more, political power's more. That's more than God. Where God will let you down, those won't. And we teach our kids that, and they become fearful. And so... 
confession, repentance, transformation, that beautiful process uh, of, of how Jesus leads people through that time and time. And tell, tell me what you think is true. Okay, that's not true. Here's what is true. Now live this way. Now walk this way and stop telling me what the truth is. Ask me what the truth is and walk because I am the truth, Jesus said. I am the truth. Nothing else. I am the truth. And I am also the way and I'm also the life. So Jesus is the truth in every situation that we're in. He's the life in every situation and he's the way in every situation. People are like, what's the way to do this? Jesus is the way to do it. Let's get with him and say, tell us a new way to think about this because this way is not working. So mm. I'd like to just say a word about that as well, that incident and that time in our life. When I look back on it now, I don't know how we did it. I can't believe that we actually that we actually did it. And I have just this little phrase I always say, grace for the place. I know that God called us to move to Baghdad and we didn't really have a fear about it because we had an abundant and generous grace like manna, you know, for every day. It didn't run out. I couldn't collect it for the next day, but I had an abundant and generous grace for what he had called us into. And so I don't have it now. I couldn't go do it now, I don't think, because that's not what I'm I'm being called to do. But at the time, you know, we were. And so th think about that in your own life and your circumstances. Don't feel like not good enough because you're not brave enough to go live in a war zone. If you don't have the grace, you don't have the grace. If you had the grace, you would have the courage. And so. That's right. Yep. That's a good point. There's, man, there's, there's, I love your story. It's amazing. I think there's two things that, that are just like, there's like these warning lights in my head. And I think it's based on my own programmed fear like you've been talking about. Mm. I think my greatest personal fear is, uh, if I'm honest, is is me dying and then leaving my family to be on their own. Mm. And, and just think, it, like it, it makes me sometimes cry at night to think, oh, my, my kids tomorrow could have to be, uh, have to grow up without a dad. Right. And so that, that scares me. So the things that are ro rolling around my head right now are what happens, like, God, Jesus said that you would not die. Like, he has the, the keys to death. But people do die. Right. And mm -hmm. people on your team mm -hmm. died in that war. Right. How do you reconcile that? Because obviously it's, like, you're, what you're saying is it's a fear of death that mm -hmm. is not natural. Right. Yeah. So when I say, when Jesus says you cannot die, you cannot die, he's obviously not saying you can't physically die. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the, the physical thing that you're so afraid of is not bad. That's what Paul's saying. It's like the greatest thing that could ever happen to you was to leave this and go to that. That's what I'm saying. He says you cannot die. We think this is the best thing possible and anything past this is not as good. That's mm -hmm. what we believe. And so any thought of going past this life produces fear in us, right? And, and so what the Bible is, I don't know how it can demonstrate it anymore, is Jesus walking into our greatest fear, which is physical death. By torture. Yeah, by torture, dying that death, and then giving us a picture of what's on the other side of it. And he's saying, I am the way to never be afraid of this because when you pass through this dark death thing that you're so afraid of, this is what's on the other side. So n stop thinking, of, stop being so consumed with it. When you think about, and this is, this is what conf why confession is so important, when I said to our kids, look, I think I'm going to prison for 10 years, I wasn't a... I wasn't really afraid to go to prison for 10 years. I thought I could survive it. What I was afraid of is my Jewish wife being left on a militant Muslim island for 10 years. So when God says to me, tell me what you think about this. So here's my confession. God, if I'm not there, my wife is unprotected. Do you know what you're telling God? <laughs> that he's not the protector. I am. Mm. That's, that's, that is a lie. That is an absolute lie. So to say... And, and my kids, if I'm not present, their life is ruined. What am I saying to God? That you can't help them unless I'm there. Then, my friend, you are in big trouble the rest of your life because even when you're there, it's not going to work. 
That is not what guarantees a happy kid is that you're there. Mm. What, ha- what, what, what makes a kid into what he's supposed to be is him understanding that Christ is with him, not me. Mm. That's, that's, I'm actually deceiving my kids to think that our life is great as long as dad's here. That's a lie, to t- and it will burn them. Um, so that's the confession part is like, God, what, where, who told me that unless I'm here, nothing works. That makes you the Messiah. Hmm. We had this thing on our team where you have to look in the mirror every day and go, I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. Can God raise my kids better than me? Yes, he can. Can he do it with me? Yep. Can he do it without me? Of course. It's my joy to be with them. But if I'm not with them, why do I think all joy is gone? Hmm. Why do I, why would I not think, wow, it, if, if, if God is who he's, if God is love and everything he does is based in love, him removing me from the life of my kids is because he loves them. And it's an honor to them that he's going to walk them through this. And they will say, yeah, we miss our dad, but wow, Jesus, so with us and we will be with him one day. Hmm. So it's that's so that's what I'm saying. That lie is so subtle, and we believe it so strongly. But the way we know it's a lie is it produces fear in us. Hmm. Anything that produces fear in us, we need to go back and go because perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. But we have to tell the truth about what we're that's right. afraid of. Not just here's what we do. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm afraid. God, I'm so take away the fear. No, you have to ask those deeper questions. Why am I afraid? What does it mean that I'm afraid? What is what am I really telling myself? Not just, oh God, please take it away. Hmm. Right? We have to confront it and see, get it, get it out. Cool. Well, I'm on my way there by saying it here, right? That's right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. That's exactly right. You just confessed. That's what you just did. And and the scripture says, confess your sin. Confess, not your moral failure, confess your separateness, the things that separate us from each other and from God. Confess them to one another in order that you might be made well. But we don't, we won't do it. And just on that note, I, I want to clarify, we tend to separate from God, think Adam and Eve hiding because of their guilt and their shame and their fear. But God never separates from us. So when Jamie's saying that, mm. he's not saying that... God's always with us. Yeah, God pursued there. them in their separateness and didn't let them stay separate. So it's, it's in our imagination, in our mind, that we're separated. God but- wants us to cast our cares upon him. Like, Lord, I'm afraid that if I'm not with my kids, it's going to be a disaster. Cast that on him because he cares for you. He doesn't want that fear to affect any decision-making in your life because you will miss the kingdom because of that kind of fear. And the enemy knows it. The enemy knows it. So, mm. yeah, that's that's what truth sets us free. Wow. Um, like I said at the beginning of this episode and at past episodes, I could literally go forever. But uh, we're running out of time. So <laughs> mm. <laughs> y'all, y'all have somewhere else to be uh, after this uh, recording. So... Um, I think we'll have to stop it here, but maybe in the future we can um, we can get another recording with you someday if you're ever in yeah. town or we want to do something in distance. I would love that. Yeah. I hope everybody else who's listening to this right now uh, really <laughs> felt God speaking to them through you because I felt it. I felt it in, in me. So thank you so much for your wisdom, um, for all the struggles that you've been through so that um, in that refinement, you can bring this wisdom to us and truth. Yeah, uh, It's really, really amazing. Um, if you've made it to this part of the podcast, um, I hope you love it. So please leave us a review. Help us get this message out. Help get more people to hear this truth um, because we, we, man, we need to be released from fear. We really yeah, need that. That's right. Amen. So, uh, you know, the one small part of how you can help with people do that is review this podcast. Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so I'm just, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, right now we only have six ratings, just six. So we're, we're brand new. Let's get it out. All right. Let's get the, the word out there. So what a great episode. Thank you, Jamie and Donna, so much for joining us here at Beyond the Lines. We record here at Central Christian Church in Phoenix, Arizona. Our church is pursuing the mantra of love beyond, which calls us to empathize with people who are different than us and build bridges of peace. If you're interested at all learning more about our church, check us out at centralaz.com. 
Um, we have online services as well as a bunch of different locations in the Phoenix Valley metro area if you're local. We'll see you at our next episode of Beyond the Lines. Until then, start loving Beyond Your Lines. And live fearlessly in your true identity. <laughs> <laughs>